Ugh. You ever just you ever just hurt everywhere? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. Alrighty, so welcome to the show, sir. You are C. T. Phillips, author of the Villainy Saga. Uh, actually, C. T. Phipps. Uh, Phillips is the uh, slightly different variant on it. Phipps. Okay, I apologize. I'm not invaluable, and sometimes I get names wrong. It happens. So, um, I usually start off with the get to know you question. Um, what do you want the audience to know about you? What's interesting about you? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I am 40 years old from Ashland, Kentucky, which is uh, pretty much the middle of nowhere in the state of, that I love thinking as the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, but I do love it uh, very much. I am a former uh, teacher at university, and I have written 21 books. That's a pretty impressive Most of catalog. which uh, are uh, fairly decent uh, reads, I like to think. Uh, but uh, the ones I am most favorite uh, of are The Super Villainy Saga, Agent G, and I Was a Teenage Were Deer. Oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 when I was looking at your catalog a little bit, I saw the Weird Deer one, and I was like, I think that that is the first I've ever heard of that concept. <laughs> yes, that was that was one that came to me as a lightning bolt there when I was like, I want to write the uh, Were a Wolf uh, Shifter kind of urban fantasy book there, but almost all the predatory animals have been done, probably as porn by someone. <laughs> And I was like, what is a plausible but still not very used concept for a, a shifter? You need an animal that's powerful but hasn't been covered like lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. And I'm like, well, deer are fast. They're iconic animals, and they're not as ridiculous as like a were-rabbit or something. So I was thinking, you know, I Was a Teenage Were-Deer is a book that will immediately grab uh, people's attention as a title. Right. And, you know, it did. Right. That is you get you got it man that is a a attention grabbing title because it it just sticks out you know you never hear where deer i mean it's just it's novel even saying that because i think before i read your title i'd never seen that word so and i and i i absolutely agree too about the the other animals being used ad nauseum it's something I'm guilty of in my own writing, but I do it shamelessly, so so be it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Anything that's been in the Monstrous Manual has been done to death. Oh, yeah. Is that even a thing now? I don't know for 5th edition if they've ever done uh, you know, I All of my uh, nerd uh, culture is out of date. I've only played Pathfinder. I haven't played any of the... Uh the actual editions of D and I, I just had a Pathfinder group that I was part of for a while and I did enjoy the shit out of it, but, uh, I don't know if 5e has a, a new monster manual for it or not. I've looked through some of the monster manuals for other editions because Pathfinder uses a lot of the same monsters, but, uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I dabble in yes. nerd culture. I'm if not they weren't copyrighted. I would have already written beauty is the, in the eye of the beholder, a romantic, uh, I stalk a filled aroma. <laughs> oh God, beholders! Talk about eldritch abominations. Yes. So. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to front or or lie to you. Um, normally, I have a set of questions to jump into, and I, mm -hmm. when I was reading your novel. It, it quickly occurred to me that I wasn't going to be able to do a typical set of questions like I normally do because your writing defies the kind of analysis that I typically put writing under. It's very meta and camp and it knows it's ridiculous and therefore it, it can't be scrutinized because when something is unrepentantly ridiculous and camp, it scrutiny is meaningless. Yeah. So 
this is going to be more of a free-form discussion where we just talk about the book instead of you getting probed about it. Well, you know, it's kind of funny there. Even at the start of uh, this book, uh, it kind of defies description uh, for me, too, because I was actually attempting to uh, write some serious urban fantasy books there, you know, like Be the Next Jim Butcher, and I had this, like, little brain candy uh, bunch of concepts of uh, sheer ridiculous... Uh, everything I love about comic books and everything ridiculous about them that was in my head that I just need to get the paper and I'm like no one is ever going to read this so I might as well just go all, all out with how strange and bizarre it is it's like oh hey let's put Harley Quinn and Bane in it and uh, oh no no let's uh, just make a concept that oh time is weird he used to date Supergirl I mean no one's ever going to read this why not just make it as ridiculous as possible they broke up because she uh because he uh, never figured out that the girl with glasses was his, was a superhero and because she was hypnotizing him and I think that was at something in the Silver Age. And, the, and Oh and, and he fights the authority and some anti heroes. Oh yeah, yeah. You mentioned the nineties were all bleak. <laughs> eh, oh god, you you there's so much to unpack with that little rant there. <laughs> oh I mean, my like, god. Yeah, like 30 years of, of, of comic book fandom all just thrown into a blender and hitting fair pay. And somehow yeah. everyone I, uh, who read it seemed to get it. <laughs> Even yeah. the people that didn't get quite all the jokes got the central... Oh, yeah. It's... I think I understand what he's saying. Yeah, it's unrepentantly... Parado par not paradoxical. Um, par Making Paradox parody of... I'll just say it that way. It's unrepentantly yeah. making parody of comic book culture and the some of the absurd shit they do. I, I absolutely love you you do this thing where the villains like to like to establish street cred. And it's basically like the, the thing with super villainy is everyone's just trying to have the most street cred. And it's it's so hilarious. That that was the, like a big shtick with the supervillains in this book, because even though it doesn't apply to every single comic book villain, it does apply to some of the most iconic ones. Joker comes to mind immediately, and when you think about comic book villains and you think about the gimmicks and the themes and all of the absurd bullshit that they do to fall in line with them, and then. <laughs> And then you just, you just make a villain who's called the typewriter, who's wearing around a fucking typewriter hat. Just, just, you, you couldn't get more in your face parodies. Oh, oh yes, there's God. also the ice cream man. Oh yeah, you know, he was actually, I thought, I thought he was a gentle parody to be quite honest, because there's literally been <laughs> real comic book villains who have been way more absurd than that. So oh, yes. I thought the, I thought the yeah. ice cream man was positively tame <laughs> in terms of parody. Oh yes. The, the typewriter was like, Oh, okay. What do I, I'm just going to go Adam West, except he actually kills people. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and, it's like, just treat this entirely absurd premise with as dead seriousness as you might uh, get, and it gets funnier. Right. Right. When you... I love, I love that, that, that uh, trope where the ridiculous concept takes itself seriously. I've always loved that trope. I think it's comedic okay. gold. It's practically a bottomless well of comedic oh, gold. Yes, yes. And... I mean, you hit the nail on the head with the typewriter. The, I mean, uh, he a, a copy editor who goes insane and blows up his office workers because they can't because they can't fucking stop sending him horribly erroneous typing, and then he just goes on a crime spree where he's the just a walking cliche of villainy, no superpowers to speak of. So he relies on gadgets that he has no business having because he's a B-list villain, and you just but you make him a threat by giving him this absurdly powerful gadget. 
it um, yeah it <laughs> yeah it it screams i, I think I, oh yeah i i remember i just free forming that scene there and i'm like throwing this stuff there it's like okay we have a guy who's even more absurd than the Riddler, uh, oh, but yeah. giving him, give him the kind of Batman origin, the animated series, serious origin episode there, and then I'm just like, why not have like a washed up but once incredibly terrifying villain working for him as a, hench, a random henchman just to show how <laughs> villains go through decay? It's like the one shot villain who breaks Batman's uh, back, but you know, uh, but for like ten years afterwards, they don't know what to do with. Him. <laughs> You know, and, and moving away from your work, just to touch on Bane a little bit, because you, you brought him up and you've made it clear Diablo Man is based on him. Bane was one of those uh, villains. Well, yeah, he... Go ahead. Oh, well, it was just like, uh, he's uh, close enough uh, to uh, the general archetype there. Of right. This diabolical uh, genius that was uh, just has suffered the serious villain decay, which happens to uh, a lot of villains that don't have the classic archetype kind of thing there. Whenever you try to introduce a new villain in comic books, I've noticed ever pretty much anything that's past the 60s there, uh, they'll show up, kick Superman's ass or whoever, and uh, show that they're absolutely million. And then, like... Three, uh, ep- his their next three appearances will be increasingly uh, ridiculous, and probably some writer making fun of them by having them lose to the Atom. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, and and Bane just as a character to go back to what to to go back to the point about him, Bane as a character got done really dirty because oh yeah he's a strategic genius and. Statist- and when when you take someone who's a strategic genius like that and charismatic with the ability to lead like this, mm-hmm. statistically speaking, they do very well. And he's lost for mm-hmm. some of the stupidest reasons in the comic books. It's only right. because they put him up against Mary Sue's, like Batman and Superman, who are mm-hmm. both Batman being arguably the smartest human being to ever live in his universe... And Superman being mm-hmm. a omniscient godlike superhero, it's like in uh, any other setting, Bane would be a terrifying villain. But you put him up against unstoppably uh, smart and unstoppably powerful. It's like this isn't fair. You're doing Bane so oh, yeah. dirty. <laughs> yeah, uh, B- Diablo Man is uh, Bane, a little uh, Deathstroke, uh, because uh, we have this incredibly uh, super intelligent, dangerous. A villain who's for whatever reason has a his his history in Gary's world is he was menacing teenagers for like whatever reason, <laughs> and and I also just like through and he's a satanic luchador, right? I thought that was a, I thought that With was tattoo pretty funny. powers. I'm like, I yeah, thought and, that, and, yeah, that was and Gary is like genuinely admiring this figure for his uh, past of uh, presumably horrible crimes, and I'm like, <laughs> right, you were once a contender, man. Now you're working for the typewriter. And now you're working for the typewriter. He's, <laughs> I love <laughs> I love that bit of dialogue Di- Diablo Man has where he's like, I can't believe I've been reduced to this. <laughs> I, I felt that. <laughs> I loved that bit yes, of dialogue. I, I, yes, I, I called uh, the super villainy saga an inverted Spider-Man with the, uh, the, the basic premise of Rocky. <laughs> Wait, wait, Rocky, the, the, the boxing movie? Yes, just okay. the whole premise of, like, oh, he's a, he's starting at the very bottom and working his way up. And, right. And the, the joke essentially being that he keeps establishing his he, anti-hero cred by accidentally killing other supervillains. Right. Or not so accidentally, they're even much more than committing crime. <laughs> right. I You know, to, that just made me think of one of your rules of supervillainy that I... I I'm curious why you established this, and I want to discuss it a little bit. You have a rule of supervillainy in your book that the supervillains never kill A-list heroes or or important heroes that are recognized by the Hero Society. And I wanted to know, it just now I decided I wanted to know why you have that rule set up like, and and where you came up with that. Well, it's essentially another one of those metatextual rules is like there's this incredibly deep, rich uh, and deep uh, undercurrent that's uh, supposedly 
it exists in my world, justifying all the ridiculous things in uh, comic books. And the idea was, uh, why do supervillains seem to have so much difficulty uh, killing superheroes, even when they have them in their power? Why they revert to the death traps that are so uh, seemingly escapable? And, you know, uh, managed, sometimes managing to beat them, but never quite finish them off. And I'm like, well, what if I just applied the rules of, if you kill a cop, the cops are going to kill you? <laughs> yeah. To the whole thing. And uh, the idea that uh, Gary uh, kills, uh, ends up, uh, and this is not much of a spoiler, midway through the book ends up killing X-Force. <laughs> because right. uh, they're blow, they're blow, some Rob Liefeld uh, parody versions of them, at least there. And then, like, five seconds later, Superman comes down and takes him <laughs> up. And it's just utterly, uh, they drop what they're doing, and the, the, the A-listers just utterly take care of <laughs> Right. My... And I'm like, yeah. If, if someone ever did pop Batman off, then, you know, the Joker would end up in the Phantom Zone, and that's just the end of that. <laughs> I, you know, if if someone ever did knock off Batman, I think Soups would go all in justice mode on the existing villain base of Earth, because I think, I think Soups is more than capable of doing that. Oh, yeah. 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 That's just just the whole idea that there are these unspoken rules between the various. I mean, in my uh, world, Gary is not quite a. Oh, the rules are more like suggestions because obviously there are super villains that do not care. Gary meets a guy called the Psycho Slinger who is yep. ridiculous, but he's a hardcore serial killer, and he just, just casually mentions like I killed everyone in Oakland or <laughs> or plan to do it. Yeah, just yeah like, he said his. Uh, uh, he said he wanted to kill Oakland. And then he was surprised when Gary didn't have a city he wanted to kill. It's like, not everyone gets unrepentant murder boners, Psycho Slinger. Like, oh, some yes. of us are I in it for the glory, so you fucking sicko. Yeah, Psych uh, Psycho Slinger does not care. He has no uh, rules that'll keep him bound there. But, uh, yeah, you know, other professional criminals who just want to make uh, money while keeping their street cred, uh, keep these kinds to, to reduce heat, so to speak. And uh, it's I found that the idea that there's all these unwritten codes of the street kind of like in, into certain levels of real life, uh, or at least ex the stereotypical cinematic version of it, uh, would and that might explain some of like why supervillains keep getting uh, caught rather than killed. Because, you know, oh, I, I put up a fight, but don't permanently maim your, the people you love or so on. <laughs> I mean, if and I also even fudge some of the rules there superheroes don't have a quite as firm and no kill rule in my world there they'll uh it would be a shame that you know you fell off that building and they could not catch you in time <laughs> if i was After a superhero you... that's how i would be oh it's yeah it's just a shame that 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 batarang that i threw at his hand to disable him uh you know went through his eye and killed him just Oh, just yes. a goddamn it's just like, shame. <laughs> it's, it's tragic that he he died of his own villainy, accidentally uh, falling up, down that staircase uh, fifteen times. Ah, oh, God, you know, just so tragic. He he, you know, he he could have reformed. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, uh, died while died while resisting arrest. <laughs> Not my fault though. <laughs> look, look, look. But yes, who's to say I what that was the camera saw? Clever. Yeah, I, I, super, superheroes will do their very best uh, to uh, try and take you in alive right until you hit certain points, in which case they they will drop the uh, pretense. <laughs> right. And I thought that made a slightly more, if uh, if not believable, authentic feeling world there, because oh, you yeah. have to. Ha because you can make the most ridiculous world what you can you can imagine, but they but you ever once you establish a rule, as long as you follow those rules, the audience will follow you uh, down that road. Oh yeah, yellow brick or otherwise. Oh yeah, I I have an entire video on my channel here on my channel about plot holes, and that is one of the major points I make. If you establish rules in your own world and you can't follow them, your story's trash. And oh. I I have an entire forty minute video. Not gonna say which one. <laughs> and it's and the biggest problem that 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 story had besides the horrible prose that sounded like a twelfth grader or not no like a more like a fifth grader wrote them was that he could not follow his own rules 
and it was just the most frustrating thing. It, it, there was no logical consistency, and logical consistency is what makes your ridiculous, campy, meta, parody novel work. You set rules, and you might bend them a little, but you do not just ignore your own rules. And it makes the story cohesive and and gives gives us a sense of, okay, at least there's something to go by in this world. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the, that's the funny thing I've actually found about the Super Villainy Saga, which is uh, six books in there, is it's not even that you have to establish rules that make any sense. It's you, people, As long as you have these established rules and you follow them, as ridiculous as they are, that per, alone provides the grounding. If you made vampires that are afraid of lima beans, if there are lima beans in this story and they are terrified of it, they'll go with it more than if the vampires don't. Right, right. Suspension of disbelief is a mighty <sighs> powerful thing. And you can use it to great effect as long as you don't destroy the suspension of disbelief by breaking your own rules. Nothing... Funny thing. That... Go ahead. My vampires are not afraid of lima beans there, but in my a vampire novel, which was called Straight Outta Fankton... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that uh, the vampires do have the uh, traditional Romanian weakness of being forced to count sesame seeds. And it's oh, like, yeah. where did that come from? It's like, it's magic. It doesn't need to make sense, but it's a rule. <laughs> right. I, I've i seen that rule. It's like rule... walking corpses. You're questioning that part. <laughs> right. I've seen that rule referenced uh, more so for fairies having to count grains of sugar. But, yeah, that, that absurd thing. And it, it, it goes to the idea that magical creatures have an inherent... OCD because that's in their nature and so that's a fun little rule of magic to play around with this this yeah. inherent OCD-ness you can apply it to all kinds of magical okay. constructs and and it, it gets fun playing with some of those folklore based rules of magic which you do <laughs> and yeah with the super villainy saga there also I feel like uh, you can Take the comp even farther with, again, uh, treating the premise as seriously at this point, but also trying to get at least a, some emotional core of it, too, for as weird as this may be, that Gary, for all the fact he is living in uh, a place that not only superhero comics happen, superhero com all superhero comics have been happening in for the past, like, 70 years. So, so there's the random references left and right to things like, oh, yeah, Gary's dad fought in Vietnam, too against phantom right and and Which i think there was something about world war amazing. three in there uh you know i don't probably i think it was that was when the aliens attacked right. for the first time then they just stopped counting right <laughs> yeah oh yeah and uh and uh there all and there's all that history there and it's in the background of gary's world but Gary is still a guy who was a, a bank teller who just lost his job, is married, and has an ex-girlfriend uh, he's still kind of attracted to. Right. Maybe a couple. <laughs> right. You know, and that's one of the things about... So in the, in the about section for your book, you say that by the end of the book, if, if you sympathize with the villain, I did my job, you say something like that. Mm -hmm. And probably the most... Probably the thing that serves that goal the most is his relationship with his wife like despite the fact that he's a little bit of a sociopath and doesn't care when he kills people and he has no qualms about stealing and property destruction none of that shit he genuinely cares about being a good husband and mm -hmm. there's just something about the quality of wanting to be a good partner that makes someone instantly tolerable no matter how shitty they are elsewhere <laughs> Oh yes. Uh, yeah, I, Gary, Gary is even a little surprised by himself. It's like, huh? I just killed like five people. And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I remember. I, I should probably see a doctor about that. <laughs> right. I remember there was at least two or three passage where he where he's like, you know, I should probably feel guilty about this, but at least I care about hurting my wife's feelings. <laughs> yeah. Which is. <laughs> Which is hilarious in and oh, of yes. itself. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh man, I forgot uh, that yogurt. <laughs> oh yeah, Manny is a, uh, Manny is the uh, the great 
was one of the great sauce secrets of uh, the Super Bunny saga and their relationship. I really cherish his crazy and, and as the bumps uh, go up and down there. And there is, of course, the the uh, most unbelievable element there that uh, any of the uh, past girlfriends and uh, Mandy would be remotely interested in Gary. <laughs> you know, I think I had to. I, I think I had to spell as it, like it's Gary's just unrealistically attractive for a geek. <laughs> right, that's what I was about to say. I was I was saying I was about to say like you don't describe Mouth his looks for the. You don't describe his appearance really. And so he could yeah. look really any sort of way. And he does yes, say I... in the book that he tried to, he tried, he made an effort to be charismatic towards women. And so it's like, well, damn, he's just that one in a thousand nerd. All right. <laughs> uh, yes. I th Well, you know, it's slightly more believable there with, uh, with the way that things have changed there, but it was written about five years ago. And this, this, there was still the lingering pre uh, impression there, but the first piece of hate mail I ever got, which is kind of funny there, because uh, uh, was a uh, one-star review after like a slew of, of five-star, oh, this is the most hilarious thing I've ever read there, was this guy who actively resented this one little rant. I, it's not even a rant, like Gary just making an aside there where he talks about how he was really uh, got lucky a lot in college because he uh, just you know tried to uh, give show his girlfriends a good time and uh, make sure... Uh, they enjoyed the experience as much as him because we're all uh, there uh, to get laid. And that guy took it so personally. Uh, just the, the, just like, he's no talking about, you know, the rest of the book or the super villain. He's like, it's like this is just some propaganda for the women. What the <laughs> and he's like, the soy or what the hell I, the, the incel rant, I think was what we call it now. It's like, Pleasuring women is uh, is no way to get laid. <laughs> oh my God, I can't decide. It. Do you think he was being serious? I, I, I you know, I'm, we've reached the point in this where I no longer can take any rant uh, as ironic as an assumption because nothing is too stupid for. <laughs> oh God, that is sadly true. Oh, I feel bad oh, for yes. any I, woman I, who's I, ever gone to bed with him. <laughs> Uh, that's there. I'm fairly sure either they haven't or uh, it's <laughs> was not somebody get I, a yeah, body I bag. I, I kind of regret that I that didn't have Gary like reading that letter at some point in the book. You write another one. <laughs> oh yes, uh, you know, and sadly there are there were si not quite as intense as that one or memorable, but except. Essentially, the ones that were like, oh, this is the propaganda for the gays and the uh, feminists and the so on. And I'm like, okay, man. I just, it's, and it, this guy took personally the Diablo man is Mexican. And I'm like, uh, do they not exist in your world? <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> yes, I just like, uh, the, the, uh, and uh, I've also I've also got praise letters uh, for like my, for the diversity of the cast, like the fact Superman's black and uh, and and uh, and the uh, Wonder Woman uh, character is Indian. I'm like, uh, it's like, oh, oh, I did not know these were statements, but apparently some took took them really seriously. Right. It, you know, God, I'm not Gary likes to uh, likes to have his partners uh, like him and uh, pleasure. Them. And apparently that is a, a great feminist statement of of uh, and a betrayal of the masculine race. I'm like, you you didn't yeah. get late in college at much at all, did you? No. I, I think I didn't take that advice personally there, but it came, but when I did, it worked. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I I've never understood. I've never understood guys <sighs> who have that. This stupid interview has gone mentality. in odd directions. <laughs> Oh, any any interview with me is bound to go down rabbit holes. If you oh, yeah. if you watch my other interviews, I go down rabbit holes. That's yeah. just what I do. Yeah. But yes, Gary is the anti is uh, just the villainous Peter Parker. So that just <laughs> uh, just the fact he used to date Supergirl and uh, he's got his witch wife and uh, uh, the uh, not quite Harley Quinn character was his uh, girlfriend in high school. So it's just like, it's like. It's like, and I'm like that kind. Of, those kind of absurd connections are also just part and parcel. I mean, if you looked at Jimmy Olsen's dating life, it would probably look the same. You know, I resent that comparison to Peter Parker just because Spider-Man is my favorite hero, and he's far too intelligent to be compared to Merciless. <laughs> 
Uh, Gary's Gary is a, what I would think a very high intelligence stat, low wisdom. <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> we could debate I, I, that I one, that, sir. I don't know. It's just like it was a funny thing there because uh, also another because I love just throwing in random trivia and like you know Gary just like casually uh, quoting Nietzsche and so on. There are just other uh, points like. And then, you know, just making the stupidest decisions because he has no impulse control. But uh, he, he is uh, a guy who has made a really very bad series of choices, starting with, why would you want to become a supervillain in the first place? You, you know, <sighs> when I mull it over a little bit more, I think, the, yeah, I, I, I'm shining up to it. The low intel, the high intelligent, low wisdom thing, it, I guess that is a fair assessment because... He does demonstrate some reasonable uh, ability to strategize and and think things through and not be a complete jackass. <laughs> it's just so often the, under jackass like attitude is, is is his greatest enemy, just generally speaking. There, but no, I mean in the Peter Parker comparison, I love Spider Man more than anyone there. The whole premise of Merciless is with great power comes absolute irresponsibility. Which is sadly so much closer to how a human would actually behave in a superpower scenario. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, I think I even used that to justify why there's so many more supervillains than superheroes. Oh because yeah. Because when uh, so many people get immediately when you get superpowers in this world, nine out of ten people just used to be a jackass. Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have this idea in their head that humans are inherently good and everyone is basically good and blah blah blah. And it's like. You clearly don't live in the real world. Humans are no, inherently no. very flawed animals, and we need to be oh, yes. taught uh, not to be shitty. Oh yes, uh, you know, just general, general, all sorts of uh, mayhem. And the, Gary's reaction is a fairly. And the sad fact is, in his world, his reaction was actually fairly tame by comparison to how it usually goes. Right. <sighs> so. So how, how many of these things have you wrote now? Uh, there are six uh, mer super villainy uh, saga novels. Uh, the second book is Games of Super Villainy. The third is Secrets of Super Villainy. The fourth, Science of Super Villainy. The fifth, uh, that's where I thought the series was going to end. Then I had an idea of doing the Tournament of Super Villainy, which is the extended parody of Mortal Kombat. <laughs> That's, and that's that one, it was just cool. like, yes, the extended period. And, you know, I also made that the, the multiversal crossover. And just even though that makes no sense, throwing in my characters from my urban fantasy and uh, science fiction novels into the into the Gary verse where, uh, oh, yes, now the Were deer is on the cover of the Tournament of Super Villainy, uh, Jane Doe and uh, and the guy from my space fire and. My uh, cyberpunk assassin is like, what the hell is going on? Am I hallucinating? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, yes. And Don't after wear that, I did... Uh, yeah. She's, she, uh, you can look it up in there right is, now in the Tournament of Super Villain. Is named Jane, Jane Doe. Doe. Yes. <laughs> what else would her father name her? <laughs> I mean, their last name is Doe. <laughs> they have a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> They're wicked. That is, uh, that's good. She's a waitress at the Dear Lightful Diner. You just leaned into it, didn't you? You just, you just said, you know what? Oh, yes. I, it, puns. It, it got even better because after doing all those puns, I, I said, oh, yes. And where do you have a weakness that they have to do wordplay? Like they, like they're, they're. Like they're, their fairy weakness of counting where you mentioned where do you actually are physically incapable of not making puns. Oh God! <laughs> that so would get themselves. That would get so insufferable so fast. Yes, and of course I give Jane Doe the fact that for whatever reason she hates puns, probably because she grew up around them in a family of such, and just right. physically forces them down whenever someone uh, <laughs> when the opportunity presents itself. Puns are the lowest denominator of humor, and I oh, yes. I hate when I laugh at a good pun because it's like oh, yes. this has no business being funny, but it's so funny. 
Yes, you know. Her father, John Doe, uh, mother, Judy, uh, sister, Janine, and uh, brother, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> you should have... It, see, if I was going to be as ridiculous as you rot- routinely are... I probably would have just had all of the kids be named Jane or John Doe, no matter how many there were. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. Uh, the George Foreman, yes. Uh, yep. Oh, God damn. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, this is something that was mm. that was kind of irking me through the book. And this is probably the He has book- a best friend who's a werewolf. And is just a vegetarian. What? The Jane Doe? Yes, her best friend Emma is a werewolf. Like the gentlest, most uh, ladylike uh, kind of uh, person in the world. While she's the aggressive uh, carnivore. (sighs) Moving on. (laughs) I want to know. I'm both torn and uh, and repulsed by the idea of reading this book. I can just see it on your face. (laughs) Right. Right. It's it's like, man, that might be fun to read, and I'd probably hate it. (laughs) A good old thanks, I hate it. Uh, No, but um, I want to know, did you you give Merciless the power of intangibility just to take it away? (laughs) I I had, the funny thing, there's actually consistency to Merciless's uh, odd set of powers where he can create fire, uh, ice, Turn intangible and uh, also see the dead. Well, Merciless has the power of a ghost, or at least uh, roughly approximating there. And that was the Nightwalker's whole thing, because it's the Reaper's cloak. Right. And, you know, intangibility, I uh, thought, would be, uh, how is Gary going to survive, uh, given, <laughs> given he's not invulnerable, the constant never-ending danger? Either give him the Wolverine's healing power or invulnerability. And intangibility works much more because... It 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 works perfectly for keeping him alive right up until the point he forgets to use it or isn't fast enough. So right. I felt it was a very cinematic sort of power. And Gary, unlike Kitty Pride, is willing is perfectly willing to use it in the most brutal manner possible. Yeah, I I still need to go up to a point where he like uh, just does the I rip, I stick my hand into your uh, chest and uh, rip pull out your heart and then I accidentally get it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> like. Uh, Oh, there's something like ninth metal or something. Uh, uh. <laughs> what I love about the power of intangibility is it's like the ultimate utility mm. power. If you were truly able to phase through objects and become intangible, you could do the law would cease to have any hold on you. You could murder people it, literally without effort because there's a nerve bundle in the, in your neck where it feeds down into your thoracic spine. And if you were able to grind away your vertebrae and expose the raw nerves, it takes that, that much pressure to kill you. If you just touch the nerves with your finger, it would oh, yeah. shut them down. And so you could literally just walk through a crowd of people massacring them and no one would be any the wiser because it would just like a bunch of people were fainting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that's actually the interesting thing there. That Gary's powers are spectacularly good for killing people. Uh, and that actually is something that the Nightwalker obviously had to work very hard not to do when he had the Reaper's cloak. He was the superhero. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the and Gary just like, you know, plows through this uh, collection of uh, much harder, nastier people because... You know, he being a a villain does not have the same uh, problem with. But it's only later in the uh, books where it's like, okay, I need to figure out ways of not killing people because I'm just starting to get a bit of a reputation here as a mass murdering psychopath. Well, you know, when you go around (sighs) calling yourself merciless, that's kind of the, that's maybe the reputation you would want to build. Well, that's Gary did not think that through, and Clearly. I remind you, it's not just merciless. It's merciless, the supervillain without mercy. Trademark. <laughs> you got to say the trademark. You have to mention that last part. It's just not. Yes, you have to add that part. You got to say trademark every time. Every time. It's like it's like. Otherwise, uh, who knows? We'll be misusing your IP. It's like a pimp named Slickback. You got to say the whole thing. No need for the Mister. <laughs> oh yes. Uh, 
Gary finds out that he actually has marketable merchandise there uh, because uh, <laughs> saving the world means that he can profit from that while not profiting from his crimes legally, according to his lawyers, <laughs> which he did not know he had either. <laughs> he he didn't know. Uh, see, now you're tempting me to read the rest of these damn things. <laughs> Diablo Man and, and Cindy set up a kind of little media franchise out of his uh, <laughs> out of wow. his efforts when he gets back from space. Wow, that is truly ridiculous, Al. Al, but it does fall right in yes. line with the rest of your world, where everything is like corporatized, and and the 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 heroes are in bed with the world governments and. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I uh, just like, uh, oh, well, oh, we have the authority to just like arrest any super villain we want and take them to the moon without and do our own trials. It's like, right. is that legal? Right. <laughs> it's like, like according to the UN, yes, it is. <laughs> that extra judicial treatment, and and then night and then and then cloak, aka Nightwalker, aka Lancel, was uh yeah. was chiming into Gary's head and he said something about uh, I I didn't support this it basically returns us to a feudal system and it's like yeah yeah if you if you got extrajudicial superheroes that just have the authority to arrest people and do what do what they want you you basically got a world run by superheroes oh yes and there of course there's part of that's part of the uh another one of the subtle jokes i was playing with here that in uh this world uh allows uh, the quote-unquote vigilantism and uh, uh, extreme abuse of authority by superheroes is just part of the uh, world because this is just a, such a crazy uh, damaged place there. But And Gary thinks, oh, superheroes are bad and, you know, supervillains are uh, heroic kind of rogues fighting the system. And, you know, then we meet the actual supervillains other than Gary, who are Tom Terror, the Nazi, <laughs> Lex Luthor, and... Uh, He's like, yeah, no. And the yeah. superheroes are like, oh, uh, are you you're sure your pillow isn't nice in your cell? Is there anything we can get you? Some magazines? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be here for your rest of your life. But, uh, you know, that doesn't have to be terrible. I was, I thought it was kind of interesting that you made the villain's cells quite pleasant. And it, and it was, and you mentioned this inside the story, but it is quite disturbing that they were able to recreate Gary's living room because that almost assuredly means that the Society of Superheroes has watched him and his wife bang, and that's just a horrible intrusion of privacy. <laughs> it's, yeah, well, it's like, did they just, like, scan it from orbit, or does it, they have the records of it, or just... And then Gary's like, it's like, wait, I used to date his daughter. <laughs> Was he watching me with the supervision this entire time? Right. Ugh. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. yeah. You I, should... I'm planning for the for the seventh book, which is a short story collection. To, sorry, eighth book, for, which is a short story collection, to have a Gary deal with Santa. And he's like, okay, you're just describing an Orwellian state, man, with you, this omniscience you possess. How do you... Do you know... Uh, uh, that whether naughty or nice when you're actually looking at me or is do you know all of it at once <laughs> right so if you actually look Very into focused. the santa claus I, mythos i need you to help me fight the krampus right he is orwellian <laughs> light like good natured orwellian <laughs> it, it yeah santa yeah. claus is when you actually dig into him, oh, a yeah. terrifying figure <laughs> oh yeah yes it's like i thought that was weird when you passed out weapons in the narnia books <laughs> <laughs> You know what made That's me... the kind of humor, if you want to know what my books are about, uh, that Gary would point that out. <laughs> you, what made me mad about Santa passing out weapons in the Narnia books was it's like you are arguably one of the most powerful entities to ever exist, and you hand us weapons that aren't just busted beyond belief. Like, we still have to try? Like, come on, man. I know you have a nuke in that sack. Give me the nuke. <laughs> That, this is, again, the kind of dialogue that, that, that made people fall in love with Gary because that's the kind of thing that would come up. <laughs> right, right. If Gary, oh, God, if oh, Gary yeah. met Santa, 
he would definitely say, look, man, I know you have a targeted nuke in there. Give me the fucking targeted uh, nuke. It's like, why are you even coming to me? I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Not even my holiday. It's like, it, if you drank Coca-Cola, it's your holiday. Right. <laughs> Santa's like, look, Gary, look, uh, look, I'm sponsored by corporate America, okay? You're an American citizen. Yeah. You you get a present. <laughs> or in your yeah, case, a big fat lump of coal. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like... So, I, I, there were some bits of dialogue that were so good, I absolutely had to highlight them and, and talk about them because they were just so that, they were just that good. So the first one here, is oh thank god one of the bank patron one of the, yeah one of the bank patrons said the superheroes are here to save us and then gary promptly tells diablo man to break that man's legs uh yeah that, that was a moment was like oh gary you, how could you do that it's like super villain man <laughs> right. just a reminder he's not a good person i mean it was it was the delivery because the the patron is like, oh thank God the heroes are here, and then, and then Gary's like, Diablo man, yes, break his legs. <laughs> it was just so deadpan, and it was so good because it it thoroughly established that Gary was indeed a villain. <laughs> <sighs> Because robbing a bank, robbing a bank is relatable. We all want a lot of money to not have to work. And we all agree that most of the people that run banks, the CEOs who get bailed out, they're, they're corporate crony capitalist assholes. Yeah. Yeah. So we all agree if someone robbed a bank, we don't really care. So that doesn't establish Gary as a villain. I have to have him break someone's leg. <laughs> It was uh, funny. Oh yes, I, I knew the a moment that would be able to establish Gary as a character is like, the idea that he uh, stops a bank robbery so he can rob the place himself. <laughs> right, and which which is just a uh, hilarious that trope. It, it I don't see it enough, honestly. I wish I saw it in more movies where the vi the, the villain who primarily preys on other villains. I love that trope. Mm. I think it's. Oh, yeah. It's not done enough, just plain and simple. There's so many twists you can put on it. Mm. Mm. So, the other piece of dialogue, and, and as a Christian, this one made me laugh so hard. <laughs> Gary, Gary says, Cloak, does God hate me? And then Cloak responds, It depends which God you mean. I've met several. Gary says, the Jewish one, to which Cloak says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just, <laughs> as someone, as someone who struggles with morality, and so, and who, and who often fails in the endeavor of being a good Christian, that line of dialogue was yeah. hilarious to me. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, being as the ruler of Gary's universe, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quiet dog. <laughs> but yeah, that that bit of dialogue was absolutely hilarious, mm -hmm. and, and and there's yeah. several more that are along those same veins. But those two those two exchanges mm -hmm. are really my favorites out of the book. Just, just witty and deadpan, and mm -hmm. and and they and I think seamless. I think those are also good examples of what I call the extended joke, where it, it's already funny to begin with the first couple of lines, but then you just keep building on it. Oh, that's my favorite style of humor. That's absolutely my favorite style of humor, where we take something funny and we build on it and beat it into the ground until every drop of hilarity has been laughed out. That oh, yeah. is my favorite style of humor. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
So, uh. unless you have something to add, uh, I, I'm, I'm comfortable wrapping it up here. It is getting, yeah. it's 1 a.m. for you now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, unless you have something to add, uh, a last minute plug or, or a one mm. more discussion of topic, which I'm more than willing to do, uh, let's mm. hear your end of interview plug where can people find you where can people go to buy your stuff all that good shit well i uh, i personally would just like to say if you are going to check out the super villain saga and you do like audiobooks the audiobook version is probably better to do even more than the uh red one there because jeffrey kafer does a fantastic job with the voices uh i'm planning on doing a new uh seventh volume soon called the horror of super villainy which is a parody of uh, Gary just stuck in 80s slasher movies and uh, various uh, the cabin in the woods kind of uh, humor. Uh, oh, God, that was uh, a good movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it should be uh, fun uh, because there's plenty of horror characters in comic books and, you know, uh, ranging from Ghost Rider to Swamp Thing and just Gary blundering his way through uh, that genre. And... Uh, I think, uh, re and I'd love to, uh, for people to also check out my other uh, series there, uh, Agent G, which is the cyberpunk one, and as uh, close as I can get to being a se serious while uh, still having a character who just cannot stop being a smartass. I just, that's... Uh, Jane uh, Doe is in the Bright Falls Mysteries, which is, uh, surprisingly enough, a good deal more serious than Gary, at least in the context that it's more Buffy than outright uh, absurdist. Uh, uh, the horrible uh, wordplay uh, weakness that her race suffers. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, if I was going to recommend things, also straight out of Thankton, which is what I call Clerks Meets Blade. Oh, God. That just left a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a vampire. He works the late shift at a gas station. Uh, you know... Mur murderously powerful killer just you know not much call for that now that vampires are out in the open and no longer fighting the hunters and the other supernaturals and they pay taxes and it's like where's my uh my horde of willing supplicants oh oh they're with the rich vampires <laughs> yeah you get turned into a vampire it turns out you don't actually automatically get your own castle <laughs> that's hilarious Oh, yeah. I can just picture... Brad Pitt gets turned into a vampire. He's fine. <laughs> I can just picture Jay and Silent Bob as vampires. And Jay, Jay, a cute girl walks by. Jay's like, hey, yo, girl, let me bite your neck and suck your tits. <laughs> that, that's not off, off, far, far from uh, Peter and David, who are just uh, the, two, uh, the two guys who are just traveling through... Essentially, Blades uh, uh, movies there where, you know, <laughs> the sexy, dangerous Illuminati vampires are fighting against the uh, the murderously racist hunters. And it's like, what the hell is going on around here? Who the hell are you? Why are you shooting at us? Uh, death to bloodsuckers, man. I hate them. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. All righty. Uh. So, I will have all your stuff linked in the description, your Amazon link, your uh, website mm. link, uh, all that good stuff. It has been a pleasure talking to a, a fellow nerd. I think, you, although admittedly, you're a far superior, you're, you're like a level 10 nerd. I'm probably lurking somewhere, somewhere down here around oh, two no, or three. I'm sure, I'm sure you're a nine, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're too good. Somehow Gary is even nerdy as I am, but, but yeah, thank you. He brings out the worst, I mean. Talk to you later, man. All right. Have a good night.